Welcome to the Safety Share, a webinar series brought to you by CIM Magazine and the CIM Health and Safety Society. I am your organizer, Michelle Beacom, Managing Editor of CIM Magazine. Today's presentation is Battery Electric Vehicles, Pros and Cons for Operators, and is sponsored by B2 Gold. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you uh, to ensure you have optimal audio, make sure that if you are using your computer audio, that the button for computer audio is selected. If you dialed in by phone, please ensure that the phone button is selected. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. The questions will be held until the Q&A period after the presentation. Note that we will have some poll questions during the presentation, so pay attention. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We are excited to be partnering with the Health and Safety Society to be able to bring this series to you. I'm very happy to have Nelson Bodnarchuk with us, both to host today and to help make this series happen. Nelson is treasurer for CIM's Health and Safety Society and serves as a, a director on the board of Ibokati Capital Resources and is former Vice President at Torex Gold Resources. Welcome, Nelson. Thanks, Michelle, and thanks to everybody who's joining today uh, online and anybody down the road who's watching this on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. Um, this episode of the Safety Share will explore key, key factors uh, that mining companies are looking into or should consider when deciding if and how to implement battery electric vehicles. We've all heard the, the term BEVs. Uh, being thrown around over the last few years um, and including like we're looking really at the stories to how we got started including long-term costs versus benefits and really talking about um, hopefully uh, the stories and experiences you folks have had on the panel today so that attendees can walk away with some insights on the pros and cons of implementing a BEV fleet um, and some of the best practices uh, for fleet optimization and uh, you know, that are crucial to health safety considerations and all throughout the BEV life cycles, because even though they are um, more efficient, there's all kinds of pros to them. There are some cons and there are some things to consider when it comes to battery life cycle management. Um, with me today, and you know, folks will see on the screen, Sam Ranelli, Hertian Beckers, and Mike Mayhew. Um, I'll start with Hertian. He's right on the beginning of my screen here. So Hurchin's VP of Mines Tech Services at Torex Gold. He has extensive leadership and experience in mining and early exposure to electric mine design. And prior to joining Torex in 2021, he worked with Newmont and Glencore, holds a master's uh, in mining at, in, and petroleum engineering at DeLift University of Technology. Um, Mike Mayhew is the founder uh, of Mayhew Performance Limited with over 30 years of experience in mining pioneered the development of the first 40 ton uh, battery electric haulage vehicle uh, and enabling um, Mayhu Performance Limited, Limited to consistently deliver safe uh, on schedule and on budget results. Mayhu Performance Limited specializes in battery electric vehicles and renewable energy, providing tech, technical and operational expertise to global mining clients. Sam Ranelli, and finally Sam Ranelli, the VP of Technical Services at Ferran Mining, has over 25 years of experience in mining operations and technical leadership. He leads efforts to adopt new technologies for improved safety and efficiency. And of course, before joining Ferran in 2023, Sam held roles with Newmont, Goldcorp, Stantec, and Extrata. So he's been around the block, like the rest of the folks on the panel today. Um, he's a professional engineer with a Bachelor of Engineering from Laurentian University and an MBA from Schulich School of Business. I hope I said that right at the end. Okay, so I'll just get, give some context for the audience. You know, early days of BEV tech in mining, um, Kirkland Lake Gold partnered with a company called RDH and Artisan to retrofit, uh, retrofit Sandvix uh, L203 and later developed um, a three and a half yard uh, LHD with an Artisan battery. Uh, Epiroc followed with the ST7 and the MT2010 or 2010. Um, both BEVs using artisan batteries. And then of course the board in mine implemented BEVs support uh, equipment, but not LHGs or haul trucks quite yet. 
Um, I'm not sure where they're at. Maybe Hurchin could fill us in today. Um, and at Kirkland Lake Gold, uh, the folks invested in building the first artisan, I think it was the Z40, so a 40 ton BEV haul truck, um, which was released at Macassa Mine in March of 2018. So I'm going to start there, Mike. Um, you were involved with those projects. Uh, Hurchin and Sam have been involved with their own projects. We'll get to those folks later. They're in the operations these days. But, you know, can you tell me a little bit more, Mike, about the idea to go electric, where that originated on those teams that you're part of? Yeah. So thank you, Nelson, for the invite and the opportunity to speak to uh, everybody here. Um, so a little bit of the history, you touched on it at Macassa, but it in, in actually backs up to 2012 where really Macassa had to make a decision and obviously the mine was getting deeper and um, they had to either spend the money either in a refrigeration system and or go battery electric. And so the guy, the guys that really should uh, started all this, his name was Brian Hinchcliffe, uh, for those that might know him, and also a gentleman by the name of called uh, Rick Lemieux, who owned RDH at the time. So they basically come up with a concept and an idea. They retrofitted the LH203 um, loader and they put an artisan battery. Artisan was a company out of California. They specialized in batteries. So they knew the battery business. Obviously, Rick uh, Lemieux, who owned RDH, knew the LHD business. So that was really the, the footprint that it started off in, in 2012. Then it just expanded as you talked about over time. But the root cause, or I guess, or the main decision to drive battery electric vehicles, the mine was getting deeper, it was getting hotter. So they had to make that decision and that's exactly what they did. And they just kept going over time and with the technology as it continued to grow. And today it's still, there's still some of the equipment still operating at the Macassar mine under the umbrella of the Nego Eagle. Great, thanks for that, that uh, little bit of context there, Mike, and how things started. I'm gonna go backwards across my, scene, my screen here. So Sam, could you fill us in on where the idea started on your teams at Ferran and, and you know, how did it go at the beginning and where you are today? It'll give us a little bit of history lesson there. Yeah, right on. So as I'm sure the audience is aware of, of Ferran's history and who Ferran is a, as a company, this started uh, right at the start during our PFS and in line with Ferran's net zero vision. So during the PFS, uh, at that time, trucks were added in as part of that F PFS. And by the time the FS came around, uh, the, the technology got a little bit better. Uh, OEMs had uh, a better offering. And so we considered, or there was a consideration to add the LHDs to complement the trucks. And then through discussions with the OEMs, uh, the, the drills were added, the jumbos, the production drill, and the bolters. That's, that's one component and, and uh, how that journey started. The other component was not necessarily just the equipment, but also uh, consideration for the batteries. And so there was two options for, for uh, Ferran at that time. There's, uh, you can either lease the batteries or you can purchase the batteries. So there was some uh, decisions that needed to be make, made in that regard. So when, you, when you're thinking about leasing, you're thinking about batteries as a, as a service. Um, and, and so when we were, the team was reviewing the contracts at the time, they recognized that, and, and as an owner or an operator, your, your intention is, for lack of, of a better way to say it, is to, to kill the batteries as fast as possible. And now, what do I mean by that? You want to utilize, you want to, you, well, you want to have a high utilization on your equipment. And everybody recognizes that batteries have a certain lifespan. And with, with the contracts and the way the contracts are set up is there's a cap on, util, on, on utilization. So you pay a certain monthly fee, but if you go above that cap, then you pay a premium for that. And that obviously doesn't work necessarily for the operators. So you gotta be cognizant of that. Uh, so, as the team was figuring that part out, we recognized that we could uh, look at some government funding. And the way the government funding works, in this case, it was the Strategic Innovation Fund that we tapped into. 
Uh, there's up to 20% of capital that can be applied and that cannot be applied to any leased equipment, but only purchased equipment. And so that evolved to um, doing some uh, calculations, business cases, and recognizing that the better option for Ferran over the longer term was to purchase the batteries. So that's where we landed in terms of how we got a full fleet of gear, the reasoning for it, and and how those batteries kind of coupled into that decision. Very cool. Um, and we'll get more into that in a moment, but uh, Herchin, want to give you an opportunity to talk about what I believe is the largest fleet to be implemented, largest battery electric fleet to be implemented on the planet at a mine to date. So let fill us in on uh, your experience and journey with Torex. You're on mute. Uh, I'm so sorry. All right. Um, yes, we're holding on to that claim as long as we can. Um, but it won't be that long, probably. Um, so listen, for Torex, it wasn't as much as an idea. I think it was very much a logical progression in, in how Torex was developing and growing as a company. We started off with open pit mining, a small underground mine. And as we saw the end of the mine life for the open pits uh, coming in, in the future, we found this new deposit, Media Luna, which was going to be an underground mine um, to be built from the ground up, literally. And so that immediately meant that we had an opportunity to design for battery electric. Our operations are in Mexico, our head office is in Toronto, we have a lot of influence uh, from the Sudbury and, My and, and Timmins mining camp in our organization. So there was already quite a bit of familiarity with the, the advances of the battery electric technology. So that played a big role um, in, in, in that decision or, or that move. Uh, and secondly, you know, Torx wasn't afraid to, to work in that space of, we don't like to say innovation, but more early adapter of, of technology. Um, and and most, most specifically at our site, you know, a lot of people that have seen the picture of our site will have seen our RopeCon, right? So this air that's bringing the, uh, the ore down from the open pit mine, uh, essentially across a, a suspended conveyor belt, which actually generates energy as the material comes down. Um, so as a company, even though, you know, there was, there was a lot of uh, sort of the Media Luna mine was really the next big mine for us um, and, and the one that we really had to count on. We also felt that the, the battery electric technology had advanced far enough that you know, it wasn't in that innovation space anymore. Um, we, we were comfortable that we could consider you know, a large fleet of, of that equipment to be used at, the, at our mining operation. Excellent. So I'm, what I'm hearing a lot of is like, there's a solid business case for implementing BEVs over a traditional or conventional diesel fleet. Um, you know, let's, let's get into a little bit of there's pros and cons. And I think there's a lot of myths floating around out there around uh, BEVs themselves and, and, you know, implementing a fleet sounds like a risky business here. You know, we've recently heard over past webinars over last year about some learnings with uh, battery fires. So, you know, let me let me go back to uh, you know I'll, I'll I'll bounce back to Sam and I'll go back across my screen the other way here. You know, what were some of the pros and cons uh, and the deciding factors that you folks looked at when you were deciding on a BVs? Obviously, we talked a little bit about the economics of it. Sounds like it's making economic sense. You know, whether you buy or or lease is is one you know one part of that decision. What were some of the other aspects, more from a health and safety perspective, or even a mine efficiency perspective, that you guys found? was part of the yeah was, yeah so so from 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 our perspective firstly i think even just before getting into pros and cons i think depending on whether you're an operator or a contractor you have to ask how it fits within your business for us it was a bit easy uh, nelson in the sense that uh we are a startup so we don't have an existing fleet and whether it's aged or not aged uh, so, you know, think about deciding factors. That's one of the things we uh, 
you know, was a uh, an advantage to us being being a newer company and including it as part of our FS. You know, we knew that at the time that BEVs were a proven uh, technology, you know, going back to Mike's comments earlier and how it evolved and when it evolved and where it is today. Um, yeah, for us on the deciding side, it, it, it's in line with two of our values, two of our four values, that being care and innovation. And, you know, now, you know, when you think about pros and cons and you think about the safety, uh, deciding factors and the impact to the environment or the, the reduced impact to the environment, that, that was, that was uh, a pretty large uh, component of the decision making. Costs were a little bit further down the line, although we are a company that's obviously, we, we don't generate a revenue right now, so we're very sensitive to that. But, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Foran's vision, net zero vision was a, you know, a, a right at the top in terms of a deciding factor. And when you think about safety, you think about uh, replacement of diesels, you think about the impact to the operator, fumes, noise, vibration, uh, there is less chance of fires than when you think about diesels and the heat uh, and the components all in and around the engine, uh, in and around, even with the oils and, the, and all the different fuels there. And then from, from an environmental perspective, obviously, low carb, lower carbon emissions, the impact on ventilation, um, and even in line with our value of innovation, um, you know, which is a, a very strong focus here at Fran. You know, we, we, we've adopted one of the, I think it's the second heat exchanger at, at a Canadian mine, which, um, you know, reduces the air temperature in the winter from nine, minus 19 to minus one before it goes back underground through the fresh air rays. So, uh, you know, uh, that was a key deciding factor for us. So yeah, lots of other lots of other pros and cons on the on the safety side, um, and a lot lots to consider there that we've evolved as a team to understand through this process, even in terms of interactions underground and the fact that there's less noise and the impact on people when you think of a pro con, like a or a con on that end, and we've been talking about how to deal with that, uh, knowing that they're very quiet and we've got people working. In, in you know various locations underground. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Mike, I want to go to you for a moment, and and just to build off of what Sam just mentioned, you know, from your perspective, you know, May, Mayhew Performance Limited is working with you know several different companies. It's it's not a specific situation. Yeah. What are some of the things that that you would recommend folks consider when they're looking at BEVs versus traditional and and maybe even some of the myths that you run into, especially when it comes to health and safety aspects of implementing a fleet like that. Yeah, and I think um, Sam touched on it, and I'm sure Gurchin will too, you know, working with some of these people online too as well. And we work with clients around the world. And let's be transparent. EVs don't fit everywhere at every mine or every application. So the first things, you know, we got to look at, Number one is fit for purpose and, and, you know, look at the mine design, look at the production profile, look at, you know, the ore body, what it looks like. And then also then after look at the equipment that's available out in the market to fit the mine design and mine plan, not the other way around. That's where a lot of people get caught up. You know, they buy the equipment, then they make their mine fit around and they design it, which is a, a problem because it costs a lot of money and time. So I guess what I would say overall, I mean, you know, from our perspective, when we're sitting with the client and being part of the client's team uh, on the owner's team, we're looking at all those key factors. And really at the end of the day, what it really boils down to, it's what the what's your purpose? What's your why that you wanna go to battery electric vehicle? Is it, you know, is it basically a board decision? Is it basically a ventilation requirement that you need at depth? Is it, you know, maybe is it something completely different from, uh, you know, reducing your greenhouse uh, gas emissions? So that's really, really the, the major factor. Then everything drives after that from a decision factor. Then you go through the trade-offs and you think about what is the right fit for the application depending on the mining method and the production profile. From a safety perspective, 
you know, there's a lot of things to consider. Uh, as you know, Nelson, and uh, we talk about battery management and logistics and strategy and storage. And, you know, to Sam's point, the risk is low, but can it happen? Yes, there's three fires that happen in the industry so far, knock on wood, hopefully it never happens again. But, you know, they could have all been mitigated, right? And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that. But the biggest thing for me and hopefully for the group, it's all about your battery management and your strategy because the equipment's proven, it runs, it operates, it's been around since 2012. You know, it's just about how you're managing your risk and making sure that you've got good programs and maintenance programs in place to keep people safe. Yeah, thanks for that, Mike. And, and Hirsch and... Um, I know, you know, Torex, uh, you know, based on our, our lead up to this, this uh, session has implemented parts of that fleet already, if not most of it. What what are some of the learnings as you get into operations and actually tweaking it? And um, what are some of the myths that were busted for you folks? And, and how did the what were the pros and cons you ran into along the way? Yeah, well, <clears throat> if I first actually take it back to. Um, you know, how this journey started, which was, as I said, we wanted to buy, build the Media Luna mine with, uh, with, the, with a battery electric fleet as, uh, as, as part of it. Um, and, and part of that was to build on one of our strategic pillars, which is um, to, to build on ESG excellence, right? We're located in an area which is not uh, a prolific mining area in, in Mexico. Um, so being there as a mining operator actually uh, enables you to create a lot of benefits to the local communities through employment um, and through further development of the, the economy in the region. Um, and then, as I said, on the other hand, we've had already made some good progress uh, in, in the area of ESG as well on the environmental side through the ROPCON. Um, our existing operations were using filter tails as well. So we didn't have a, a dam holding back water uh, upstream from what is actually a large basin uh, nearby our operation, which is uh, a source of, uh, uh, of of income for the nearby communities through fishing. Um, so we still obviously needed to do our due diligence to confirm that this was the right decision to, to move forward on. Uh, and really the three main areas that we looked at, I mean, obviously there's the capital cost, there's the operating cost, but there's also then the greenhouse gas emissions. And in our case, because we're not based in, in Canada, um, we know that the, the power on the Mexican grid comes from uh, burning uh, uh, fossil fuels. So that, that needed to be taken into consideration. So we really looked at the whole uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, trade-off between the mining fleet itself, but also the power associated with the fleet and the associated ventilation system. Um, mm -hmm. And that actually became a significantly large factor, the, the reduction of power required for the ventilation because you're running so much less diesel equipment underground. Um, so, and then, as I said, capital cost, we know it comes, uh, a battery electric equipment does come at a premium, I'll say. Um, but again, offset by less or smaller fans that we needed for our main ventilation system, even some smaller openings that we needed to bring ventilation underground and, and exhaust it. Um, and then of course, you know, the operating cost there as well. The operating cost, you know, two years ago when we did this work, um, still a very large unknown, right? And that's, that's something that remains a, a bit of a challenge. There isn't a lot of information out there, operational experience about running, especially a larger, uh, battery electric fleet, right? There's, there's a lot of companies that have, and I'll say dabbled with some tests with maybe one unit, two, maybe a little bit, um, but it's not representative of a of, of, of full implementation. Um, so in our case, listen, it's still very early days, right? Our, uh, our mine is just, just getting into the first ore uh, from our first stopes, um, but we're still waiting actually for the uh, our conveyor belt to become available, and that will really kick off production. So a lot of focus right now has been on the operations readiness side. Um, large part of that was obviously getting the operators trained, getting the maintenance people trained in this new technology, um, getting the supply chain set up, 
to to support those uh, the the maintenance people that are going to be looking after the fleet. Um, and then you know there, we've already talked a little bit about that 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 risk that is out there, perceived risk that is out there about you know batteries exploding or fires and and you know there's there's stories out there and there's images out there of of some pretty significant fires of uh, of battery electric vehicles in public or in public transportation or on roadbeds and so so we we did spend a lot of time on on that portion uh, which was really integrating what I'll say is you know the mine rescue team right the people that have to jump into action if something does happen in, in the underground environment and, and getting them ready for it. And actually I'll say as well, and you know, Mike was heavily involved with us when, when we went through that process, um, really learning um, you know, what, what those risks are in terms of you know, a battery potentially you know, taking off thermal runway catching fire uh, and actually demystifying, for example, this myth that you know, the whole thing is going to explode. Right and how you can best uh, address that and and getting the people ready for that and and, and trade up to do so. Um, <clears throat> aside from that, as I said, you know we some of the equipment has shown up on site. Um, we've started some of it, and you know obviously the loaders are some of the bigger equipment. Uh, very well received. Uh, people are pretty excited about uh, about just operating a piece of equipment that is that quiet uh, but also that powerful. Right, and that's uh, that's something really that. Um, you hear a lot of positive feedback about, um, and and you know one thing actually I didn't talk about this, but I think it's important for the audience to understand as well. One of the reasons as well behind our thinking, and not not a main driver, but again, on the I'll say on the ESG or on the people side, a very important element. As I said at the start we had an open pit operation that was nearing depletion and we were going to replace a large part of that ore feed from this underground mine as a very large employer in the region we then also had the intention or have the intention to actually take this open pit workforce and bring them underground and you know i think anybody that has worked into mining knows that an open pit workforce typically is very different from an underground workforce. So making that transition actually had, uh, you know, some elements of risk to it, right? It's it's a completely different mindset. Um, and so that was one of, uh, as I said, also one of the underlying reasons or benefits of creating that, uh, I'll say, more you know, worker friendly environment underground with the quieter equipment less fans running and obviously much better air quality yeah great and i've heard that uh from talking with a few of those operators that they like the bluetooth uh enabled stereo as well with their phones so <laughs> get their own music the playlist while you're working um yeah. okay so this is the time where in the webinar here where we flip it back to the audience to see if you've been listening i'm going to ask michelle to uh pull up a poll here and we'll get the folks online queued up to answer some questions here. Um, do I see the poll? I'm not even sure. We there see it, it. So based on what you have heard, this is for everybody listening in at home. Uh, what's your top priority using a BEV instead of diesel? So health and safety, environmental, operational efficiency. Are about 35% voted. So I'm just going to give it a couple more moments here. As the numbers pick up, and uh, just just so everybody knows at home, we've got a few more questions. We're going to have another poll, and about quarter two, ten to to the top of the hour, we're gonna you know we're gonna change over. We've got a few questions, so if you have any questions for the panelists, uh, please don't hesitate to type them into the questions box. We've got a couple that I've queued up. We'll get to those in a bit. near the end of the webinar there and we're just about we're almost 70 percent voted so all right michelle let's uh do i click something to end the poll there we go uh that's not going to change on me again it looks like so looks like we've got i think everybody can see that on their screen now i'm getting i'm just getting used to the new go to meeting um ui here the graphic interface here but so it looks like health and safety is the main right low diesel emissions, or sorry, no diesel emissions, low noise, lower carbon footprint. 
uh, you know, and second operational efficiency. And then of course the cost consideration seems to be from the, on the, on the lower half. I think that's where it's got to start though, right? It's got to make sense. So I guess based on that, any commentary from the, from the panel before we move into the next question? Sure. I can, I, yeah, I would, I, you know, health on the health and safety side, um, you know, there's a, there's a couple of things there that I think about two main things, really uh, vehicle to vehicle interaction. When we think about critical or fatal risks uh, and vehicle to person interactions all in one, the, and the other one, obviously, uh, your Chen talked about it uh, in terms of uh, fires. So part of part of the initiative we went through, and like like Gretchen, we're 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 at the very beginning of our journey. So training, trying to understand what the systems are. Um, we have a, a really great relationship with Sandvik. They've been really supportive and very uh, helpful in trying to understand what those risks are, because obviously this is fairly new for for most. And um, you know, when you think about those two risks, those two main risks, you know, we've talked about, you have to treat it as if, as if it's, you know, a, a fuel bay underground in terms of where you locate your fuel bays or your shops. Typically, you, you recognize the risk of fire and one way to mitigate that is to locate your shops charging or your, sh your charging bays in this case near return air raises. Right. So if, if something were to occur, although the battery, the batteries themselves, uh, we're, we're, we're dealing with the newer generation or the newest generation of batteries. So there's lots of safeties within the battery themselves to monitor and to identify if there is going to be, if they're overheating. Uh, so there's a lot of feedback from the battery itself in the newer generations. Uh, but also, you know, where, where you place them. And, and when you think about where you place them, then you start to think about where do your trucks actually travel? If you typically you have your return air raise along a level and do you want your trucks traveling along that level where they could interact more so with equipment? So that's a consideration. But if you take them off of your level then and you think about putting them in your ramp, then you've got to think about you know, wh what your ventilation system is. If it's in a ramp, maybe um, if you do have a fire, you, you may run into a risk there. Uh, and so, you know, there's no regulations set yet in regards to this, but, uh, so you have to, you have to go through it as a team, include, you know, involve your oh &S team, do formal risk assessments and make sure that you've covered off on all those risks. Fire doors, if you're locating it in a location where, you know, you got, th th uh, through flow ventilation. Um, just some of the considerations that can help mitigate that perception of some of those safety risks. So, for sure, Urchin, any any further commentary on that? Um, I just think it's actually interesting because I'm looking at at the poll um, yeah. that the cost consideration sits at the bottom of the list, right? Uh, by the end of the day, you know, mining is a business, and it, it's in the business to to make money. Um, and that's why, as I said, in, in our case, we definitely went back to looking at the capital cost of the fleet versus the ventilation system, the operating cost. Um, and yes, the BV came out as, as a winner, um, but not by, by a long lead, right? Um, and I think, you know, in reality, that is still an important consideration. Um, when, uh, when you know, there's there's a lot of mines out there right now that are still moving forward with uh, with regular um, diesel equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, at, at the same time, I think it's very encouraging, considering you know I believe we have a fairly sizable audience um, that we're seeing that shift. Right, it's not just about the dollars and cents. There is a much larger benefit to to be justified in the area of health and safety as. Uh, well, really, the the top three of them here, right? Instead yeah. of just just looking at the cost, I think that's, I wanna, that's quite encouraging. Yeah, and I do. I want to come back to those costs in a moment, but but just in the sake of time here, one thirty five. We got about ten minutes left. Uh, I asked, and now we've received. We've got a whack of questions pouring in here. So before I want to save that fifteen minutes for the questions, I'm going to ask my next question directly to Mike. Um, you know. You've worked with a lot of teams, Mike, over the years. 
what challenges does an implementation team have to overcome? We're going to come back to the health and safety aspect of this, but what challenges does an implementation team have to overcome when considering things like vendor selection, contract negotiations, infrastructure, battery management, operational readiness? And and again, I want to come back to that health and safety piece because I think yeah. the poll shows that the audience is saying, all right, there's a business case for it. Here's why we want to do it. And and here's all the great other all the other spin-off benefits that add to a, a cost effective operation. So we've gotten the right. business case done, but some of those other aspects, if we jump up dive back deep into the health and safety aspect. Yeah. I'd like to get back to that too, because I have a story about Macasa when I was mine superintendent on the health and safety to share with the group if we have time. But yeah, so I mean the challenge is, I mean, obviously there's selecting the OEM, understanding, you know, what products available out there, at what maturity level they are, their support infrastructure, where are they located? Like, you know, again, Gurchin and is in Mexico and in the state of Guerrero, so it's not easy to get to. Sam's uh, you know, in Saskatoon, not in that easy place. It's not in the backyard where I'm based in Sudbury, where you know the mining community has a lot of options and OEMs. So, you know, understanding the OEMs and understanding the products and the maturity level, are they are they mature? Are they, you know, developing? So that's that's operations in particular, in particular at the operation level, you, you know, where the, these two gentlemen are, you don't want to go with a product that's not well known or at least developed and proven because that can be chaos to your operations. Um, I think about that. I also think about the infrastructure. I think Sam and, and, and Gertrude obviously mentioned it, you know, at the operations, you know, be strategic where you're positioning these battery bays and you know depending on the product that you've selected for your your equipment <clears throat> obviously you have the, the production equipment and you have your support equipment but that's very important because the cost can be very high and you know you got to be very strategic on where you're going to put them in the operations based on your your production profile and also to your logistic strategy what i call it the next thing i i go back to again and you'll hear me bark about this and people know about this, it's all about the battery management, regardless what OEM and what uh, what uh, selection you use. Because to me, the battery management is going to be very critical in how you're going to operate your mine. Sam mentioned fuel, it, you know, basically you're taking away fuel versus taking batteries, but you got to understand what the equipment is available to do. And, you know, the perception that people have, in my opinion, is that they don't understand what the equipment can actually produce versus a diesel. And if you do the comparison study, people understand that, you know, depending on the profile, again, if you're in a production profile or, you know, when you're in a stope or if you're hauling from the top of the ramp to the bottom of the ramp, et cetera, there's a lot of things to consider in that space. So the big thing I guess I'll leave for the audience is that, you know, select the right equipment for your application, understand you know what the equipment can do and you know let's not put a tesla example under in the back of me here in an underground environment because it won't stay very long so just just understanding do your homework you know make sure you understand what you're you're looking for and select the right equipment for your application got it thanks for that mike we will come back to your macassa story in a moment hurt you and I'm, I'm coming back across my screen now it's something flipped but um so let's talk a little bit more about those safety considerations. All right. So we built the business case. We've implemented a fleet. When you're implementing a fleet, there's a few questions that, that maybe we'll get answered through these questions, through these answers. But tell me a little bit about what, what folks listening should be aware of from an SOP, you know, plans considering around, you know, how to prevent and prepare for a fire and emergency response um and aspects like that right i know one of the one of the biggest issues is these things are so darn quiet that you won't hear them coming and one of the biggest hazards underground is human machine interaction right so yeah absolutely nelson uh, <clears throat> you know i think sam already talked about something very important that that we also did in, as as part of our implementation plan was strategically looking at where are you going to place this this charging infrastructure right that's a whole new element that you're adding to your fleet uh you know maybe somewhat similar to a fuel station um if if you have one but very different from you know a mobile fuel truck which is what a lot of 
uh, other operations are using as well. So that one was definitely, you know, one that you could start addressing, uh, you know, early on before it could even start showing up. And then as you move into that operations readiness part, really when when I think back about our our experience there, um, is that actually, I mean, one of the questions was one of the bigger challenges. The bigger challenge is that there is so little experience out there, right? Um, and, and and you have to acknowledge that there is that risk in there, just the risk of of the unknown. And so we actually initially struggled with that for a bit when we were you know developing the operations readiness plan because we kind of said, well, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and and I'm going to make my plug here. Um, where we then had a bit of a, a breakthrough um, was when we realized that you know the, the global mining guidelines had already prepared a pretty extensive document around implementation of battery electric fleet. And as it happened, Mike, who was already working with us, was you know very key in putting it all together. So then we actually said, well, how about we take that as a bit of a sounding board and let's develop an audit. And let's think of all these things that we may not have even thought about. And we did that exactly. And we went back to site and we started to all the people that started talking to all the people that we had been working with so far um, and asking, like, did you think about that? And what does that look like? And, uh, you know, initially, actually, it, it, it raised a lot of eyebrows, right? Because it was exactly that. It's like, oh, oh, yeah, we didn't think about that. And, oh, that's right. We need to do that. And that's one. Um, and this is where you know you know mike and mike will say i told you so yes a very big part was all around the battery management um <clears throat> the oems i think have done a fantastic job in building a lot of protection into these batteries like i'll say layer upon layer upon layer to to prevent you know mechanical uh damage or, or chemical damage uh, and the risk of you know that battery taking off through uh, through ter thermal runoff, um, and that's typically linked to your battery management system, which is only effective when that battery is actually connected to a machine. So in the case of batteries that you swap out, or even batteries that are being parked, you know between a shift change, for example. Once that operator is no longer sitting on the machine and watching, you know, the monitor, watching the lights, uh, or when that battery is sitting in that charging bay, you've lost that that typical human connection, that that human oversight. So that's that's a a big one that we identified mm -hmm. during those those charging times, and then also when you're transporting batteries, like when they're showing up on site, when you're taking them underground, when you're when you're placing them in a, in, in a holding area, or when you're moving them away uh, from site, or as I said, when you're just storing your batteries. Um, not to take wind out of Mike's sail, but that's definitely something that we've learned in, in having spoken about, you know, the, the, the Macasa experience is that most of the issues arrived when batteries were sitting in, in, in the, uh, on surface or in their junkyard. Um, you touched on the, uh, the, 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 the awareness between vehicles and, uh, and, and, and people, because yes, all of a sudden it's such quiet equipment. And especially when you think about, you know, an 18 ton loader, you still think that it's going to get such a big machine. It's going to make some noise when it's in an underground environment and it is around the corner. It is, you do not hear it operate. It is just so incredibly impressive. And then the one other one that I'll, I'll touch on as well is actually what we talked about, um, you know, when these batteries that are being swapped in the, in the swapping bin, right? That is still a fairly manual task, right? Uh, I mean, there's there's some quick, great provisions to get the battery placed, uh, but then there's still the cables to be handled. There's there's high voltage equipment uh, in in that area, um, and and as I said, because of that still being a very manual process. Uh, that provide that requires the appropriate provisions to you know make that uh, a safe work environment for the people doing that on a regular basis. Excellent. Um, you mentioned a couple things there that I think Mike might touch on in his story, but Sam, any other aspects from fire prevention or 
you know, Hurchin went in a big, I know they're, we've gone through that, that, that audit at Torex, but, but what's, what's, uh, what's Fran's aspect or what's Fran's perspective on, on preparing for and, and implementing the, the BEV fleet? Yeah, you know, I think this, this conversation is great. Again, we're very early in our adoption of BEVs. Uh, we've, you know, just recently received another LHD in trucks. So we've got a couple LHDs, a couple trucks. Uh, we received our third jumbo. Uh, we've got a, 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 a long haul drill. So we're very early in our journey, as I mentioned before. So just hearing some of the thoughts from Gurchan is really helpful. I think, like, like I mentioned before, I, sitting down as a team and trying to work through the logistics um, and how that impacts the safety uh, is, again, we're, we're, we're still working through that. So many of the things that Gurchen has discussed, uh, we've already identified. And so I can't really add any more than that. I'm sure we'll continue to learn and, and take that value from from other operators that are adopting the technology and that and i think that's really important yeah i'm going to come back to you with the with the sixth question that's going to be all for you on what what to walk away from and um but but yeah just to echo what i've heard here is you don't know what you don't know the gmgs are a great place to start and once you start working together as a team to tackle those issues you start knowing what you don't know and it starts becoming right. very easy to manage or sorry, let me rephrase that. Very simple to manage, not necessarily easy, because there's a lot of work to do. Um, but it is it is a big improvement for what I'm hearing. So let's, uh, Michelle, if you don't mind just pulling up that next poll, we're going to ask the audience before we jump into uh, the last little bit of our webinar here, what are the biggest concerns in implementing BEV fleet at your operation, if you do have that situation? I got about 10 questions for you guys that we got to get through. So, Mike, I'm going to ask you to give us an abbreviated story of the Macasa. So I want to give us 10 minutes to get through that. Yeah, I'll be quick here while we're waiting for the poll, if you want, Nelson. So sure, thank yeah. You for that. yeah sure. Um, so just the story back to health and safety it made me think of when I was operating and I was the mine superintendent at uh, Macasa Mine. You know, when I got there, you know, basically... There was no policies and procedures in place, or they were, but we couldn't find them. There was no battery management plan in place. So looking back in the learnings as we continue to evolve in this. But my story here is that when I got there, people were very reluctant to use the battery electric vehicles in the stopes uh, and the operator specifically because we had some older gentlemen with a lot of experience that just didn't want to get involved in it. So over time, as we demonstrated that they operated and they worked and we maintained them. The interesting story about a month later after, you know, I get a lot of pushback. One of the older gentlemen comes up to me and he says to me, Mike, if there is no BEVs available, I am not mucking the stope today. So my story there is that it takes culture, it takes people to get an understanding, in particular, some veteran miners. So that's one of the big learnings that I learned from from that. And we were operating 42, we were creating about 1800 tons a day. So there was a lot of challenges very early in the stages of the battery stuff as it evolved. So that's one of the things, culture, communicating your message, making sure people understand. And, you know, one of the things I could say, I want to give back to the Torex as well, because Torex didn't just status quo, they purchased the equipment, they, they implemented, but they also challenged their status quo to make sure that they had all the safety procedures and processes and systems in place and educate and spent tr tremendous amount of time in obviously training uh, their people to be ready for the battery electric vehicles. That's my story. Yeah, I, I think what you touched on there is in so far in the webinar, we've talked a lot about the commercial and the technical aspects of building a business case and then figuring out the technical difficulties that we haven't really talked about. And this is where I'll come back to Sam with this question before we jump in a jump in the Q and a session here. But a part of the session is, is that social aspect of actually preparing for the change and then managing that change with your workforce. Um, BVs are different. 
uh, there's definitely a change in how things are going to be in the future. But but coming back to it, it's a it's a it's a positive change. At least in my experience, that's what I've seen right so far, and it's been a great. And the operators are always like, it's always great when you get to talk to an operator and they're just jacked about getting in that piece of kit and 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 pulling some rounds. So um, anyway, so Sam, question for you, given our time constraints. Obviously, one hour is not enough to cover all this stuff as we've learned here. So maybe next time I'll extend that out. But what are the top one or two things uh, your folks want our listeners to walk away from with the episode? Like, what do you what do you want people to walk away from today when they're when they're thinking about this webinar? They're going. I've already got a few comments saying very formative. Thanks a lot for the for the stuff. I've got to drop off. It's getting near my next meeting. But what do you want people to walk away from today? Like two three points. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think we're 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 definitely more evolved than maybe the the perception out there. Number one, I think there's uh, great support out there through the OEMs in helping teams understand. I looked at all of the concerns there; it's pretty even across the board, uh, and I can comment on each one regarding. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of work in each category. Uh, mm -hmm. on the implementation of the B BEVs. And the one thing I think that would be really important for us as owners and operators is to have an avenue like this to really communicate some of the lessons learned from the implementations. We have a few mining companies in Canada that are further along in their adoption and have a better understanding. We've had some good relationships with them. Uh, you know, mining is a small world. We all know somebody, you know, one degree or two degrees of separation. It's really important for us to share that knowledge uh, and, and work with the likes of Mayhew Performance and Mike's team to help us understand they've been on the journey for uh, a long time. Uh, but really sharing that knowledge will help us deal with a lot of these issues. We're, we're very resourceful in the mining industry. Uh, let's just, uh, uh, to me, the one thing that, that I get from this is is the need uh, for all of us to continue to share our learnings great and and yeah i think we've got a few folks here i don't know if everybody else can see the questions coming in but um i'm going to ask you a few questions here i know you guys have covered off a few of these already and unfortunately i'm just not uh learned enough in this new uh ui to say the the Questions closed off. So I'm just going to rapid fire at you guys. Feel free to jump in here. So I'll start with the very first question that came in was what, what were the ventilation specs um, used to design the BEV fleet? You know, maybe, maybe, I know this may be a really technical question, but that, you know, we, we talk a lot about you need less ventilation. So what were some of the key specs that come to mind when you guys talk about the design of the mine? I can give you just a high level. So when you think yeah. about a diesel, a diesel mine, you think about typically they're designed at one CFM per ton per annum. Right now we're at 0.3, so it's a third. Okay. So you know that's that, that, that's the relationship. So think about the power, think about the heat, and the implications on that. Some some pretty uh, tremendous savings there on the operating side. Yeah. Excellent. Um, Maybe this one's uh, the transition. Maybe you could comment, Hirsch, and I'll give you this one. What was the transition to BEV like? Because I know Torx is further along with this, so you know there's probably a lot of planning, change management, training, emergency. But what was that like in general? In a few comments, there. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> again, as in our case, it wasn't really a transition as such because we're building a brand new mine. Uh, but there was a transition in that we were going to take our open pit workforce and and train that uh, that workforce up to uh, to operate that equipment. Um, I mean, so in many ways, a very big transition, but it was more about becoming familiar with what it is to work in an underground environment. Um, we also, similar to to what Sam had, you know, great support from the OEMs that we had selected. Um, in, in, in while we were waiting for the equipment to arrive through the use of simulators, for example, right? So already giving people uh, a bit of an idea of you know what what the look and feel is going to be. Obviously, with you know our small uh, underground operation that we had, we had an opportunity to take some people underground there from from that perspective. Uh, yeah. And then once the battery electric equipment actually showed up, giving them the opportunity 
to to work with that and and just you know see how smooth it is how quiet it is uh, before we even took it underground um so overall and it's a very very high acceptance rate there from uh, from the workforce yeah it was a, a theory sim above ground i i remember it was like the police academy movie right everybody getting in the maybe less comical but like everybody getting into the thing and doing the above ground course making sure that, you know because it's very responsive equipment right yep. like elon musk talks about i see that uh tesla in the behind mike there it's like we don't make slow cars because they're battery there's no there's nothing to gear up on they just go um michael give you this one in, in regards to interaction between vehicle and pedestrians um what are some of the considerations for proximity detection and collision uh at macassa uh you know that that you considered in early days and and you know her and sam i'll turn that over to you maybe and we'll we'll wrap that up and i'll try to ask maybe one more question after that but ultimately just as a as a precursor not a spoiler but the next episode of the safety share uh john Treen's going to be hosting a panel that'll be talking specifically about proximity detection and where that tech is today but that's in the future so what have you folks looked at start with mike yeah, so when I was operating at Macassa, we didn't have a lot of technology. We were just making ends meet. And after, obviously, when we hit the SMC zone, then everything broke loose and we sunk a new shaft. But there was very less technology. There was not a lot of technology when it came to automation, with the exception of tele remote at that time and, uh, you know, in VEV. So that's really, we didn't, we didn't have a, a very automated future of mine uh, of the future, I guess. At mm -hmm. so I'll turn that over to Sam and and, and Getchen. Sure, sure, I can. Yeah, so 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 the so the good part on our end is that uh, Nelson, we're 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 working with Automate Mining and John Treen uh, to develop our technology roadmap, and we're going through the process right now of thinking about location tracking, proximity detection, and all of the different systems that are out there. There are some variations or some slight differences between all the different uh, products there is there seems to be uh, and we're working through that now a, a capital difference so for us we're sensitive to that um, but the systems themselves have a, a lot of capacity or flexibility to do other things and so uh, that's all part of the evaluation um, and and again yeah there's it's it varies in capital but uh, and those systems do the same thing, but have uh, are slightly different. So right now we're still understanding, trying to get a, or develop a good understanding before we make a, a, a selection. Great. And very and important, obviously, yeah, with this equipment. So. Yeah, absolutely. And and just uh, Herchin with the last 30 seconds to a minute, any commentary from Torex on that? Yeah, well, probably very similar as, as Sam's actually, right? When you're developing a new mine, you think about all the technology that is out there. Um, we initially had proximity detection on that list, then actually uh, put that on hold because essentially we were saying, well, we are having an existing operation underground that does not have proximity detection. So we don't want to speak out of two corners of our mouth by saying, well, we have to have it here, but we don't have it there. And doing it at both mines was going to be quite a large undertaking. Um, but we did come to the realization as we were advancing with our operations readiness that this was not an apples to apples comparison because exactly of the, the sound element or the quietness of the battery electric fleet. So it's actually back on, uh, on the table, uh, probably not as far as advanced as SSM, but, uh, definitely something that we're actively pursuing for implementation to deal with at risk of that really large equipment, not, uh, not being audible. Excellent. And just before I turn it back over to Michelle, she's come on the screen, so that's the hook, right? Uh, before we hop off, for those of you that put in questions, Michelle will be sharing the questions with me afterwards, and I'll, I'll, I'll send it out to these folks. And any questions that didn't get answered specifically, we'll, we'll try to have answered for you and then respond in, in turn, because there's a lot of good questions in there, but we're just running up against the time, time constraint here. Okay, Michelle, over to you. Thanks, Nelson. And thank you, Sam, Hertian, and Mike. Also, a special thank you to B2Gold for sponsoring today's episode of the Safety Share. I would like to thank all of our attendees and ask that you please fill out the short survey that pops up on your screen at the close of the webinar. A link to the video recording of this webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow. 
We hope you will join us next month at the Health and Safety Society Conference in Toronto from Sunday, October 6th to Tuesday, October 8th. Uh, we will return with another episode of the Safety Share when John Treen hosts a panel on mobile fleet proximity detection, as Nelson mentioned. We look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much, and have a good afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.